Welcome everybody to another AMA. Incredible to have you all here again, just looking through the chat. And again, it's a, a group that's growing worldwide. Uh, people from all over the world are connecting today. Sorry about the uh, technical difficulties that we had getting started, uh, but we're here now and Jason has an action packed evening for all of you guys. Um, it's been a lot uh, going on since we saw you at last at a, an AMA. We've been at two different events. We had our global meetup in December where we showcased the aircraft for the first time. We were just in Anaheim, California at HAI, showcasing it again. Incredible to see the support worldwide and, and being able to meet a lot of you guys in person as well. Ruben, why don't you give everybody a little bit of an idea of what they're expecting tonight, and then we'll pass it straight over to, to Jason. Yes, Misha, it's fantastic to be back. It's great to be here again with all the friends and followers from all over the world. Today, we're gonna have another update from Jason. It's gonna be what we heard to, for about this packed with information. A lot of things are going to be covered. And as usual, which is typical and unique about the HILT program, you're going to have the opportunity to ask questions directly to Jason. So we call it the AMA Ask Me Anything. So you can uh, just uh, prepare your questions and uh, that's going to be available through the chat. You put those questions. Misha and I will be taking turns at the end and in sequence uh, receiving those. So as you hear the presentations, just take note of those. And we'll be very glad to answer anything actually through uh, Jason Hill. So with no uh, more delay, uh, Jason, please go ahead. Welcome. Thank you, Ruben. Thank you, Misha. And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, from around the world to DC1. Uh, we've got an action-packed update for you this evening. I'm going to talk first about the uh, the company and what we've been up to since we uh, we last spoke just before Christmas. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about our route to scale up, and then we're going to focus on the engine and drivetrain, and then touch on the uh, the airframe to, to finish. So let's start with uh, our event in December. We presented uh, two HX50s, one on wheels, one on skids for the very first time to the public. Uh, it was the first time uh, our customers uh, and followers had the, the opportunity to sit in the aircraft and experience the, the aircraft. And what this really demonstrated is that Hill Helicopters has been able to fuse aircraft capability with a modern aircraft from 2024 with premium automotive quality. We also validated our vertical integration strategy in so much as we were able to manufacture all of the key elements that we needed to uh, and bring the attributes and the price point uh, together at a very, very accelerated time scale. So really pleased with that. Moreover, however, we were able to validate the whole premise of General Aviation 2.0, which is if you make an aircraft that is what people want, then General Aviation can thrive again. And the response that we had from our own customer base, seeing it for the first time, their friends and visitors that came with them, and then the broader market is that HX50 is resonating with the market in the way that we always hoped it would. We then also went on to introduce our GVTOL strategy, which is our strategy for a sustainable future for general aviation, not just environmentally, but importantly, economically, making general aviation pay for commercial operators as well as our core private ownership. Um, GVTOL, as I said, is underpinned as our strategy to make GA environmentally and economically sustainable. There are four pillars to this this strategy. Firstly, we have designed the GT50 engine from the ground up to run on sustainable aviation fuel as well as conventional jet fuel. Um, we've also vertically integrated the entire supply chain to ensure uh, that we can control the costs from end to end. We can control the cost of building the product. We can control the cost of the opera operation of the product because we make everything. Uh, those, those elements of it have been dealt with over the course of the, the last couple of years. Throughout 2024 now, we intend to focus on two other areas of our GVTOL strategy. One is rolling out the Hill Insurance Program, so developing out all of the relationships with the underwriters that we need around the world uh, and the detail of that program so private and commercial operators uh, alike can have access to cost-effective insurance that is going to make these platforms work 
wherever you are in the world. In addition to that, we're now starting to define and then roll out our world-class support model. So making sure that you can see exactly how your aircraft is going to be supported wherever you are in the world. So over the first part of this year, we're going to be defining exactly what Hill Support Centres and what support partners are going to need to offer and need to look like. And then we'll be rolling that out through the latter part of, of this year. That then just leaves the final pillar of opening out general aviation to a broader market again of accessible aircraft finance. That, that'll be something we deal with a little bit later in the, uh, the program. We also took the aircraft, as Misha mentioned, over to HIA uh, and showcased the, the machine to the commercial operator market for the very first time at the end of February. Um, we didn't really know how we were going to be received in the, uh, in the, the commercial market, but uh, as, it, as it turns out, essentially, if you deliver an aircraft with the right performance, a modern up-to-date platform with the right balance of safety, uh, purchase and operating cost, and the quality that we've become known for in terms of the design and the, the general feature richness of the aircraft, then the aircraft resonates just as much with commercial operators uh, as it does with our private audience. We received an incredible welcome from the, uh, the commercial market, uh, and we've got lots of new and interesting avenues to, to pursue, and lots of very welcome feedback for the various commercial roles that people anticipate HC50 becoming involved with in, uh, in coming years. So really grateful to all the folks at HAI and to everyone that we got to meet with in the industry uh, while we showcased the, the product. So thank you very much for the, uh, the warm welcome. Uh, since we last spoke uh, ahead of the, uh, the Duxford unveil, uh, sales have remained incredibly strong for both HX and HC50. Uh, we've now sold 900 uh, HX50s, 366 C models in 70 countries, so 1,266 aircraft in total. Um, what we're seeing is that the 50 series truly meets the needs of both private and commercial operators. We've We've managed to engineer the product that we wanted and it's resonating nicely with both of those markets. So very pleased with that. So let's talk about our priorities for 2024. Fundamentally, we need to continue to grow our team to complete the development program, uh, to complete the approvals program, to get the, uh, to expand the, the production team and get HX50 and HC50 into production. Um, over the, the course of the last few months, well, since, uh, since January, we've been joined by uh, Peter Tier, uh, who is our new CEO, who's helping me look after all of the commercial aspects of the business, allowing me personally to, to focus on driving the technical side of the program through development, through approvals and into production, supporting the engineering team uh, with a much greater percentage of my time. Crucially, we need now to expand our development and production facilities. As you will have seen uh, during the, the run-up to the event, both DC 1, 2 and 3 are completely overrun now uh, with, with people, with facilities, and we've completely run out of space. Uh, the final trigger point was the need to invest in a new gantry mill machine uh, to be able to expand our composite production uh, facilities, and that has now led to the fact that we've had to grow our production facilities. So more on that later, but that's a key milestone to get out of the way in the early part of this year. We're targeting a first run of GT50 in the summer of this year, as we indicated at, uh, at Christmas, and then PP1 build and first flight within the, within the year. So when we talk about the expansion of our production facilities, um, we we briefed you on our dual, appro uh, dual site approach during the Duxford event. Uh, fundamentally, we've pursued a direct planning application to develop a purpose-built, all-in-one uh, production and global headquarters facility as long as we possibly can. And we're now at the point where we need to decouple uh, the, the need to deliver production facilities today, expanded development facilities today from the longer time period of getting a, an all singing, all dancing HQ 
uh, developed out. What we elected to do is essentially expand our rented facilities uh, to allow us to seamlessly move from development into production in a modular fashion. So keep accumulating uh, larger rented spaces until we've got sufficient capacity to produce the volume that we need uh, and then carry out the flight ops using the permitted development rules which allows us to build a facility within 28 days uh, with a planning essentially planning notification that requires only 28 days eliminating all of the the problems that we've we've had to date so in uh, to on that note uh, since the start of the year we have now acquired and completed on a lease of the facility that will now become known as production center one so pc1 uh, is designed to allow us to bring all of the activities that go on within dc1 2 and 3 together complete the development process and gradually uh, develop out the production uh, infrastructure that we need all under one roof and then we'll expand that space in a cellular, cellular manner to increase the capacity to where we need it to be in line with the targeted production date. So really pleased with that. Um, let's now talk briefly about PC1. We recorded a, uh, a brief walk around the, uh, the new facility earlier today. So let's take a look at that. Welcome to Production Center One. So it sounds crazy, doesn't it? But one of the most important things in being able to rapidly execute a development product, a development project is getting the culture right within your organization. And one of the things that's been quite challenging for us over the last couple of years has been as we've grown organically and spread from one to two to three development centers, maintaining the connection between key members of the, the team, maintaining that close knit and interactive way of working has become increasingly difficult with the team spread over three units that are just five minutes apart. What Production Centre One allows us to do is bring all of the development activities back into one location, have everybody working together properly, pulling out everything we can out of all of the real benefits of vertical integration, both for development and then as we move seamlessly into production. Let's have a look around here and I'll show you what we'll be using Production Centre One for immediately and then as we go into scale production. So in addition to having a building that is uh, around 50% bigger than the building that one of the leading helicopter manufacturers started production in, uh, we've also got an expensive an expansive yard area that provides storage facilities for us. It also provides a space for us to conduct some of the testing that we need to do outdoors. Some of the riskier tests need to be in uh, armoured enclosures and we need space outside to be able to do that. So having a yard area with uh, simple connections back to the unit will really help us and then on top of that we've got all the loading bays that we need to be able to facilitate the flow of materials in and out of the factory as well as a brand new purpose-built unit for us to build our production facility in. Let's go and take a look inside. So the thing about engineering and producing helicopters is helicopters themselves are quite big so when you lay these things out on paper and we'll show you in a minute, minute what we've, we've done for the layout of production centre one during phase one of its uh, use but the fact is it consumes space like nobody's business. So you end up with these enormous voluminous uh, facilities that you need just because you've got to have multiples of things that are about the size of a helicopter to be able to produce helicopters. So within this facility, we're gonna have the new gantry mill right down in the far corner of the facility down there, away from the offices, away from the electrical stuff, away from all the important precision stuff. We're then gonna have an air conditioned uh, machine shop over the other side for the pre precision production of gears, bearings, turbine components, servo actuators, all the other fancy stuff that goes into the helicopter. Down this right hand side of the building here will be the composites production line. Everything from the patterns and molds that come off the gantry mill all the way up here to finished assemblies of composite parts. We'll have uh, the machine shop down the far end, then the, the paint shop, some trim and build stations, 
uh, all the way through the electrical build shop, the avionics and electrical uh, laboratory facilities. And then we'll have a, a customer showroom, a customer lounge, and then all of the offices uh, up there in the, uh, the mezzanine layer. Down the bottom, over the top of the machine shop, because we have to air condition it, we'll be putting in a mezzanine floor. And then on the top of that will be the, the trim shop uh, and the, the wiring shop as well. So all of the things that we need to be able to uh, produce the various elements of this, this helicopter. So of course this place looks like a vast empty cavern, but of course you've seen all of that before with DC one, two and three. We're quite accustomed to taking empty units like this and turning them into production facilities. So this is PC1. So ironically, if you remember, the thing that triggered this, this move for us was the fact that this machine here, our new uh, gantry mill, which we need to produce all of the patterns, uh, the molds uh, for the flying fuselage, the blade uh, tools for the composite rotor blades, uh, do all the trimming on the fuselage, do all the trimming on the windows. Uh, we physically couldn't fit that in any of our existing facilities. Um, and where we're standing right here is the, the space the, that this machine will take within the, the new factory. If we just pace out here, the sheer space that's required for this machine, um, then the, the machine is essentially 15 metres uh, long by about 14 metres wide. So that means that this whole floor area here, up to about that fire exit and just before that beam there. So this whole, whole area here is required just for that single machine. And that would have taken up over 80% uh, of the available floor space that was left at DC1. But if, to put that into perspective, if you look over my shoulder at uh, how little of the space it takes up here, it gives you an idea of how much room to grow we've got here and the ability of us to complete development and then seamlessly move into production of the aircraft. To put this plan into action, we've got to create a foundation down in this corner of the, uh, the facility that's about a metre deep to give the, uh, the base for the gantry mill that's required to keep it stiff. Uh, and in place so that we can make the, the, uh, the parts and the tolerances that we need. And then as we march up this right hand side of the, the building, we've got composite kit cutting, uh, we've got layup, we've got curing, uh, we've got all of the, the elements that are required to make the composite fuselage. Over on this side of the facility, there's a mezzanine floor going in there that traps the machine shop in an environmentally controlled chamber. The production control office is going in here, mission control as Mark calls it, so we've got full visibility of all of the production activities on the, the shop floor. On the far side of the factory over there, we've got the paint shops going in, then we've got the avionics test facilities, the electrical test facilities, uh, and ultimately the mechanical build shop as well, so your gearboxes, your turbine engines, servos undercarriage, all of those crucial mechanical systems that are needed to put the helicopter together are built over there, away from the dust, away from the composites, away from the, the glues and all of the other chemicals that we need. All of this will be partitioned off so we can keep um, the levels of cleanliness that we need. And then up here towards the top end of the, the facility, we've got a customer lounge, a canteen, all of the development offices at the top, uh, and we'll be putting in a, a showroom for the two aircraft that you've seen, uh, both at our live events at the end of the year and then the events that we put on uh, at Heli Expo uh, over the last couple of weeks. So there's a lot of work to do. Uh, the, the MOVE project itself will probably take a couple of months to get the things done that we need to be ready for the team to move. But with that work done and out of the way, Production Centre One's ready to go. So let's go and have a look at the new engineering facility. Again, it's another funny thing about scaling. You know, first you struggle to get your first few people, then you get your first few people, and then you, you outgrow your management systems, and then you've got to work harder to try and manage everything. And then when you've done that, you realize you've run out of desks. So now we're fixing the desk problem. So this is the, the New Hill uh, Production Center One office suite. This will contain all of our engineering staff, all of the operations staff that support the engineering effort, and it gives us room to grow as we expand the team to cover the completion of the development of the aircraft, the approval of the aircraft in 70 countries, and then the rollout of the production process for the 1300 aircraft that we've now sold. So this has given us some room to grow, but without being so big, 
that it produces a, a punitive overhead cost at this point. So just the right balance between room to grow and what we need right now. So this is production center one. What you're gonna see over the next couple of months is us turning this plan into a vivid reality within these four walls, bringing our production capability along just in time for the conclusion of the development program. Okay, let's talk about the GT50 development. While the, the commercial team have been busily uh, dealing with the, the closure of the lease uh, and all of the equipment that's got to go into DC1 and arranging the, the removal of the, uh, the equipment from our, our other facilities, our engineering team have been busily uh, driving forward the development of GT50. So the key areas of development that have gone on uh, in the first part of this year have been the further development of the blade and casing casting development. So we're in a position now where we can cast turbine blades effectively and we're just mo moving that process development now over to the large thin wall casings. I'll talk about that in a second. We've been doing a lot of work over the, uh, the course of the tail end of last year and into the early part of this year on the blade root grind uh, the compressor and the combustor manufacture is now underway. Uh, the FADEC development is moving along at uh, pace. Uh, we've now got the first FADEC board here right on the bench over there. I'll show you that shortly. The starter generator manufacturing and testing uh, is now well underway uh, and the combustion test rig as we've put out over on the social channels a little while ago has fired up for the the first time uh, and then we'll be shortly uh, commencing the build of the final components for the gas generator testing too. So let's talk about the uh, compressor impeller manufacturing uh, to start with. So we are currently uh, manufacturing the GT50 test compressor. So this is the one that will actually run in the gas generator and the power turbine tests that are going to take, uh, uh, take place later this year. Essentially what we're doing now is over the, the course of the last 18 months or so you've seen us develop the processes to manufacture uh, impellers and curvix, get all the balancing right, get all of the quality right, get the geometry right, then do that in the right alloys. Now we're taking those processes and developing the production grade versions of those processes. So processes where every single dimension is where it needs to be. All of the heat treatment is correct. All of the inspection processes are correct so that we've got an aerospace quality part that is representative of a production article to the, the greatest extent that you can with a, with a prototype. So that's meant that we've, we've essentially, uh, we're currently essentially completing the production production optimization in terms of the material sourcing, in, tool, in, uh, in terms of tool where uh, machining these uh, these alloys is extremely demanding on tool tips and as a production process we have to make sure we trade off the production rate versus the tool wear to get the optimum balance between quality and uh, and price point for this we've got all of the treatments all of the inspections the balancing of the wheels and then managing the clearances between the impeller tip and the stationary components all of that is being brought together for this production article and uh, as, as I say, over the course of the, the next week or two, we'll be producing the first GT50 uh, impeller to run in a test engine. Uh, and what you can see at the moment is if I just drop back over here, is on the five axis, what the guys have been doing during the course of today is just picking up from where we left off uh, at the tail end of last year, working on the various cutting strategies we can use to minimize that tooltip wear and to reduce the time it takes to machine one of these impellers down to the absolute minimum. So we're sitting at about 30 hours uh, on one of these at the moment, and we think we can get that down a little bit further. So each of these different passages is trialing a different cut strategy before we go and cut the test impeller on the fully heat treated, fully inspected aerospace quality billet that will go into the first GT50 engine. So uh, similarly, we've been uh, productionizing the GT50 turbine. Uh, that started with the work that we've reported previously on the turbine blades. So Casting super alloy materials is crucial for GT50. It's crucial that we're able to do this in-house to be able to defend the aggressive price point that we need for the engine to make the whole program work. Uh, we reported uh, towards the end of last year that we'd managed to get the blade casting process right and we were developing good quality turbine blades that passed the NDT inspections. And now what we've got to do is extend that process uh, to casing. So if we just 
have a look over here for a second, Niall. Um, we've, we've demonstrated previously that we rapid prototype individual blades and then mount them on a wax uh, feeder. That then creates a, a shell or a block mold and then we cast the, the turbine blades into that, giving these, these trees here. So that's a power turbine blade. Those are two uh, high pressure uh, gas generator turbine blades. Once we've done that, the blades have to be separated off into individual blades and then we have to grind the fir tree root onto the bottom of those. And that's the area of the process that we've been working on uh, recently. So if you just uh, look at what we've got here, essentially, uh, in order to grind the, the root onto the blade, so that's a blade uh, held in a specific fixture that we've, uh, we've produced. And this then uses a viper grinding process to take a diamond dressing wheel. And again, to put some of these things in perspective for you, these things are 16 week lead time items. So each of these passages is an extremely hard material laden with industrial diamonds that allow us then to dress the fir tree root profile into a grinding wheel that we then use to grind the fir tree to extremely tight tolerances onto the bottom of the blade. So it's a multiple operation process, but essentially with the casting of the blades, with the inspection of the, the blades and the NDT that qualifies the material integrity and the, the, uh, the integrity of the geometry, once we've ground the root uh, and the wedges and the, the tips of the blades, then you've got essentially a production grade aerospace turbine blade, all made in-house by us through this palette of processes. So really pleased with how that's come together. We should be designing, uh, sorry, we should be grinding the very first fir tree roots on hill turbine blades just as soon as we cast that batch of turbine blades there. So that'll happen over the next couple of weeks or so. So the, uh, the next part of the, the turbine blade, the, uh, the turbine system that we need to produce is the turbine blisk. Now, uh, sorry, the turbine disc. The disc is the, the hub of the turbine wheel. It transfers all of the torque that the, the blades generate to the shaft, but it spins at incredibly high speed. So typically in our engine, the HP turbine spins at around 46,000 RPM. So the integrity of those components, the accuracy and the, the accuracy and the quality of these components are absolutely absolutely crucial. What we've got at the moment is we've got the very first GT50 gas generator turbine disc in production right now. This is the one that will run in the test engine over the, the coming months. We've got the, uh, the, the basic shape is turned from a forged billet. We've got a machined curvic coupling. And then as we've shown you previously, we then EDM uh, the female side of the fir tree into that. We've developed all of the CMM and the non-destructive test processes to be able to qualify that that, uh, that disc has the necessary integrity and quality. And that is sat right there on the bench here. So the, the two versions of the disc that you can see here, this is the original test article in which we developed uh, the fir tree EDM processes. And then we took samples from this to ensure that we got no uh, recast layer and we got the, the right material properties. And this is the part machined version of the very first HP uh, disc that will run in the GT50 prototype engine. So the blank has been machined. You can see it's waiting to have its fir tree passages cut into here. The curvic has been machined and this has now passed all of its dimensional inspe inspections. So we're able to produce these parts to the desired geometric tolerances to the right quality. Uh, all that's left for that one is fir trees and then we've got somewhere to put our gas generator turbine blade. So really pleased with how that's, that's coming together. The other area of the engine uh, that we've been working extensively on is the production of our annular combustor. The annular combustor is critical to make a compact, lightweight engine. Uh, it's a very difficult part to, to design because the combustion process is complex and the environment that the part has to survive in is incredibly demanding. Uh, and the fabrication, sorry, the geometry of uh, this, this component requires really complicated fabrication methods in very, very difficult materials. So the GT test combustor 
is in production, it has been in production for quite a while now, and I'm going to walk you through uh, the extent of the work that's been going on in the background there to make the, the first GT50 combustor. Uh, the process development is now al almost complete. All of the rolled parts have now been successfully manufactured. We're, we're just finishing the very last press tool for the components that can't be rolled or spun, uh, and we're just then left with the, the assembly and the welding. This is uh, an example of a process that's been incredibly difficult uh, to develop, requires an awful lot of very specialist tooling, jigs and fixtures, but once you've done that, the process is very, very efficient in, in production. So let's go and have a look at some of the, uh, the progress that's been made on the, the annular combustor. So what you can see here is essentially the GT50 annular combustor in a jig uh, that's here just to, to allow us to, to align the pieces and then ultimately drill the holes later. You can see the outer rings and the inner rings and all we're waiting for is the large pieces that provide the bird mouth to guide the hot gases around the corner and then back into the, the turbine face. Those components are particularly difficult to form because we have to deform uh, sheet metal by a very, very large amount to be able to make the parts. And if you just come over here, what you find is if you don't get your sheet metal processes right, you can essentially overstress the material and just tear it. So we've been trying to, to manufacture these parts initially using a rolling process because the, the beauty of rolling is we take flat super alloy sheet metal we can then laser uh, not laser cut we can then water jet cut that uh, into a profile uh, and then essentially simply roll that using a couple of simple rollers like this roll it through there and it adopts the the profile uh, and also the um, the geometry that you need. Unfortunately, uh, there's only so far you can go with that process until you overstress the material and it doesn't work. So we, in parallel, we'd been looking at spinning uh, parts just to see what the most efficient production process would be. And what we have found is essentially we've settled on some of these things can be rolled. You can roll some of the deep sections, but what you actually have to do is preform it into a cone. And then this, these rollers have got significantly less work to do. So it's this kind of development that takes the time to get that production process just right. So when the, the component is fully formed, the material is in the, the condition that you need. With all of that, that produces about 80% of the, the parts that we need for the annular combustor, but you're still left with some parts, such as this, for example. This is one of the, the bird mouth components that sits at the inside front edge of the, the compressor. And if you look at uh, of the combustor, if you look at the amount of form in that component, and bear in mind, this is a super alloy. This stuff is really hard and really tough and really doesn't want to bend at all. And we've got to turn something that shape into something that shape. And for applications like that, we've had no choice but to essentially go to a pressing process. So you put your, your ring, the centre of it hasn't cut out of this, but you put your ring of material into the press tool and then you drop that top one on top of it with quite a lot of force and essentially you get your sheet metal part formed like that. So for three or four of the parts, we've had to move to, to press tools to be able to make that. We've made those tools in-house, so it's not an expensive process. It's just you have to understand the sheer amount of jigs and fixtures and tools that you have to make just to be able to make something that looks fairly innocuous when you see it in the engine. And it doesn't stop there. If you come down here, once you've made the bits, we need a whole host of different fixtures to be able to hold the... Um, hold the finished parts so that we can drill or laser drill the 2,800 holes that we need to make the combustion system function properly in situ when it's built as an assembly. So this process is now coming to a, a close. The production, well the first, the prototype annular combustor is about ready for test once we've made those last two press components and then we can get that on the combustion test rig. So let's talk about the, uh, the starter generator for a second. The starter generator on the GT50 engine is unique uh, in its architecture. It's unique in its approach. Traditional older engines tended to have a speed reduction gearbox on the, the front of the engine uh, that allowed a starter generator to run at a, a more rational speed, typically 12,000 RPM, something like that. Um, in order to save weight and to simplify the engine or the mechanical design of the engine, we've adopted a 
a direct drive starter generator that simply sits on the front of the gas generator rotor. So it essentially has no moving parts. It's just an extension of the gas generator shaft sat in a fixed stator. Um, we've now completed the, the, uh, the design of that and the GT50 starter generator, uh, prototype starter generator is in production. The PMU or the, the uh, motor control unit essentially has also been developed. So all of the, um, all of the algorithms necessary to, to control the high frequency, high voltage uh, AC electric that's generated in three phases has been developed. We've also got the algorithms to drive the starter generator as a motor, and we've got the and we've been carrying out passive load testing on those algorithms using the uh, the electrical test bench over there. The actual hardware that will allow us to put all of uh, these devices together and test them properly is now on the bench. So these are the, the first few components of the starter generator. You can see the, the laminations, the permanent magnets, the rotor hubs, the carbon sleeves that support the rotors while they spin at 46,000 RPM. And then there's the first wound stator assembly for the very first GT50 starter generator. All of those things are being built at the moment and are expected to be ready by about mid-April. Uh, in order to test that, we've had to develop a specific uh, piece of test hardware. We've had to develop a, a high-speed test rig uh, that, in, that essentially provides uh, another 50,000 RPM uh, prime mover motor so that we can drive the starter generator to prove that it works as a generator and test all of the control systems and then similarly have the starter generator run as a motor and back drive the prime mover motor uh, so that we can test all of those things. The test bench has now been built and is completed. Uh, the prime mover motor has been built. That's it being tested in that video you can see at the corner of the, the screen. So we're now in a position where the MGU, uh, the starter generator hardware is imminent. Uh, the power uh, management unit hardware is already available on the bench over there in its test form. The control system's developed and the test rig that you can see uh, on that bench there is being shipped to us over the coming weeks. So again, by around mid-April, uh, we should have both the GT50 starter generator and also the test bench to be able to fully develop and qualify it right here at DC1. So really pleased with how, how that's coming together. We've talked a lot over the, uh, the program about the importance of FADEC, having a, a simplified startup and shutdown procedure, really tight RPM governing, and the dual FADEC part of the, uh, the, the GT50 is crucial to its success in this application. So the FADEC system development board, so this is the very first physical embodiment of our FADEC system has now been built and delivered. We have it right over here, I'll show you in a, in a second. The FADEC control laws have been developed and are, are now sitting on the FADEC board waiting to be tested with a model in the loop and then later with hardware in the loop. Uh, we'll show you later and we've, we've posted some stuff publicly about how we've been developing out the details of the fuel control, the ignition control and the characterization of that whole process within the combustion test rig and then as soon as that's completed essentially we're then doing some model in the loop testing and it's on to the gas generator test to use the, uh, the FADEC system to control that engine right there so really pleased with that. The board itself if I just explain it, all of the FADEC functionality is really carried out within this, this simple aerospace grade chip here. The rest of the details on the board here are really to make it easy for our engineers to uh, connect the, the sensors and the various inputs and outputs. So all of these different terminals will consolidate down to a simple plug in the production unit. And it's just this core box here that goes into the, the, uh, the unit that goes on the aircraft. You've got a power supply here and more input output ports out here. But this is the very first GT50 uh, uh, FADEC unit uh, right there uh, waiting for a gas generator to control. So really pleased to have that here uh, ready for, for testing. Um, <coughs> we released some stuff uh, about two or three weeks ago now um, showing the very first signs of life from GT50. So this is the very first part of the, the very first test rig that we're using to test and develop the combustion system for GT50. Now for those of you that aren't aware, combustion 
in a jet engine is a really complicated process. The chemistry is complicated, the aerodynamics and the thermodynamics are really complicated. It's relatively difficult to predict analytically. And so the way you design these things is to use a mixture of empirical knowledge and best practice, some very sophisticated sophisticated CFD simulations, but ultimately you're reliant on comprehensive testing to make sure that you're getting the atomization in the fuel that you need, that the, the, the flame uh, and the, the recirculation currents and the dilution currents that you need within the combustion system are doing what they want. And then building an annular combustor makes that even more difficult to develop because you physically can't see anything. So the purpose of this rig is to allow us to develop out the detail of our fuel injection models, uh, our air blast, atomi air blast atomizers, the fuel control strategy and then the geometry of the combustion chamber and the geometry of the flame to make sure that the flame itself stays where it's meant to stay, is stable, it can be ignited throughout the range of flow conditions that we need it to uh, and that we don't impinge on the, uh, the delicate combustion liners that would kill the, the combustion uh, the annular combustor in no time at all. So all of that work is ongoing and it's ongoing on the combustion test rig and the preliminary results that we had were fantastic. So in that image that you can see on the screen there, you can see that the flame is stopped and trapped near the igniter and near the fuel injection system, which makes sure that we've got fuel and fresh air and a spark all in the same place so that we can sustain stable combustion over a range of operating conditions. We're, that was the very first run, so the flame's not the right shape and it's not the right color. And there's lots of things that still need to be developed out with that. But fundamentally, a lot of the key parameters that we needed to see working in this first run worked beautifully. We can hold the flame stable, we can ignite reliably, and now we've just got to tune the, the fuel injection and the air blast atomizer to get that shape burning, uh, get the chemistry of the combustion right and get that process working properly. Let's go and take a quick look at the combustion test rig. <clears throat> so when you look at this test rig, what we've essentially got here is if you imagine our annular combustor that goes all the way around the engine, this is essentially a slice through one of the fuel injections. So it's a what this is one twelfth of our annular combustor. And the beauty of doing it like this is by doing it on a test bench, we can, we can provide windows to observe the flame. We can, uh, we can provide access for all sorts of instrumentation for temperatures and pressures and various other things that we measure. And of course, we can separate out all of the elements of the fuel control system so we can tune and optimize them independently before they get embedded into a um, uh, a compact system to go onto the engine itself. So the test rig here will allow us to develop out all of those things. There's a, a simple a simple thing that we've just attached to the side here, which is allowing us to visualize the fuel spray and test the atomization under various conditions that we need for the engine, looking at the effect of the fuel uh, control system and how we do all of that. And then at the front of it here, we've got a simple Venturi mass flow meter so that we can control the ratio of air mass flow and fuel mass flow to get stoichiometry and to get the fuel, uh, the fuel air mix and the, the chemistry of all of that process right. Uh, this rig's work to treat. We've already learned a great deal from it. There's still a lot of work left to do on this, but within the, the space of the, the coming weeks, we'll have the fuel nozzle sorted, we'll have the air blast atomizer uh, sorted, and that then frees us up to go and run this in the full annular combustor and get that test completed too. So really pleased with how that's coming together. <coughs> So one of, the, uh, one of the other things that we're having to get ready for now with the compressor, the turbine blades, the turbine discs all coming together, we also need to ensure that the static components of the engine are ready for the gas generator test. Now, one of the things that you may or not be aware of is that the outer casings of gas turbine engines are in fact high temperature pressure vessels. It's absolutely vital that those various casings that make up the engine are completely gas tight, but they're not the simplest things in the world world to seal just because of the temperatures that these, these things operate at all day every day. So there's some uh, very careful design goes into the design of the flanges and other sealing features around the engine to make sure that we can hold those hot products of combustion in a safe place away from the airframe and avoid any leakage at all. So what we've been doing
doing over the course of the last week is taking the very first GT50 combustion casing. So this is your, your main hot section for the gas generator turbine casing uh, that contains your combustor and your, power, uh, your, ga your gas generator turbine. And we've done a hydrostatic pressure test on that to ensure that it can withhold all of the pressures that it's going to see in service uh, plus a healthy margin. That passed this test successfully uh, a couple of days ago uh, and you can actually see the, uh, the gas generator casing. This was on display at Duxford uh, just before Christmas where we showed it fitted with the rest of the combustion test system. This is in its current configuration has got blanking plates over all of the orifices where various engine hardware attaches. And this was the, uh, the unit that was, was test tested, tested earlier. I did forget to mention while we were talking about castings that one of the pieces of work that's going on at the moment is learning, well, developing the, the processes, uh, how to cast these components using the same suite of technologies we use for the blades. So what you can see here is essentially a, a rapid prototyped uh, casting pattern uh, that would then be shelled or blocked, uh, ready to be poured for, for casting. So we're casting these these uh, these shapes directly in super alloys, and then we're similarly casting in uh, high-grade aerospace aluminiums the speed reduction gearbox casings at the back. So we're taking the same suite of processes we've de developed for the blades and casting these sorts of enclosures to give us that low-cost production solution for really really high-integrity parts uh, for the for the engine. So really pleased with how all of that's uh, coming along. One of the, uh, the great bits of news that I fed out to the, uh, the customer base uh, just before Christmas was after about 18 months of intensive development uh, in being able to produce high quality aerospace grade uh, gears, we'd finally got our fatigue test results back for the, uh, the, the sort of international standard spur gear test, uh, fatigue test articles. Uh, and the results for this came back and we knew we were well above uh, the anticipated performance marks. Our, our permissibles for design stresses and cycles are a lot better than we were, were, in, were expected. We've now had the, the formal reports back uh, on all of the uh, aspects of that, that testing. And essentially we are acing making aerospace grade gears. So every element of that process, the, uh, the case depth of the hardened material, the hardness of the, uh, the case itself, the fatigue parameters, the tensile strength, uh, the spread of variability uh, is absolutely spot on. So all of those things are uh, uh, a, a bang on where we wanted them to be. So we essentially are in a position now where we can proceed through, through knowing that our design permissibles are correct, we can now proceed with confidence to uh, drivetrain optimization and then full testing of the HX50 drivetrain. So really pleased with the progress made by the team on that. Let's talk briefly about the, the airframe program. I'm not going to dwell on this today. We're focusing predominantly on the, the engine. Um, essentially, uh, it's vital to us when we're creating the very first aerial Grand Tourer that the HX50 cabin seats must be exceptional. Over the course of the, uh, the last few uh, months and the last year or so, you've watched us develop out all of the elements of technology that you need to create a carbon crash worthy seat, to create various forms of energy absorber to give you the stroking functionality, to develop the adjustment and the, the, the sliding rails that we need to position the seat in the aircraft in a, a, a way suitable to fit the biggest and smallest and then we've just we we had some feedback at the the show and subsequently that there were still some areas that customers felt we could improve on so over the course of the last couple of months we've kind of gone back to basics from a comfort point of view still carrying forward all of the crash worthy stuff all of the uh, production technologies but just making sure that things like the seat back angle the seat tray angle and the subjective nature of the uh, the depth and stiffness of the foams that we use when combined with the trim materials is just right to give the best possible uh, feel to the widest range of our customers as we possibly can. So we've, we've conducted a range of simple comfort tests here and combined the really well understood ergonomic fun fundamentals with the subjective feel that you simply can't get away from. It always comes down to a subjective view of a test panel to get that seat comfort just right. That work's been done and we're now ready to package that 
that up into the production version of the uh, the HX50 uh, aircraft seat, which brings together all of those technologies and the look and feel uh, that we're all used to. In uh, in addition to the, the seat work, um, we're taking the opportunity prior to releasing the tools for the, the flight, flight prototype to build in a lot of the design updates that have taken place over the course of the last 12 months. So one example of this is we're subtly modifying the way that we mount the GT50 uh, engine in the aircraft. Um, during the GT50 engine development program, we had an opportunity to take about nine kilos out of the engine by removing the bevel gearbox at the front of the engine. But the only way that we could do this is by subtly modifying that the way that the, uh, the engine sits in the fuselage. We've now done that work. We've modified the engine insulation. The drivetrain has been largely updated. There's still a bunch of detail work there to bring it back up to the level that it was. But we've modified all of that. Uh, and we're now in a process of developing out uh, an updated firewall solution to enable us to provide the, the fire containment that we need around the engine for this update configuration. One of the, the pieces of te test equipment that we're developing to complete that is essentially our fire test cell for the firewall. Now we're trading off two versions of a, a firewall system for HX50. We're looking at one solution which is a very modern approach where we can put a fireproof layup into the laminate and make the composite fireproof itself. Uh, that has its benefits and its drawbacks but it is very very light and we're trading that off against a more traditional stainless steel or titanium sheet construction with a rationalized engine bay uh, design of the, 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 uh, the new tub. So all of those, uh, those uh, trade-offs are being done at the moment and we've got two versions of the firewall that will be shortly going on to the test rig that you can see here to show that both the composite and the metal structures protect that composite structure in the event that you have an engine or other system fire within the aircraft. Uh, the, the, one of the other areas that we're just tuning now that the mechanical systems uh, are, are mature is the things that are absolutely crucial to make sure that we get the vibration right on the aircraft. Over the, the last six months or so, we've had lots of questions about are you anticipating vibration problems? What will you do about vibration problems? Well, there's lots of things that you have to do to make sure that you get vibration right in the first place. And this is very much a focus of our efforts at the moment. So one of the most important thing things is we have to get the kinematics of the way we mount the gearbox uh, done properly. So first, first, of, first of all we have to ensure that the kinematics of the pylon is focused at the right point so the in-plane loads that are generated at the rotor head don't get transferred to the mounting. We then need uh, anti-resonant mountings for the gearbox itself to take out the vertical hop and then we need some other clever details to make sure we manage the, uh, the moments, the steady state moments that come out of any articulated rotor system. So all of that work is being captured now that we've got the finished, essentially the finished configuration of our mechanical drivetrain. So we, we know the mass balance, we know the stiffness of these structures, so we can finalize that ahead of finalizing the, uh, the tools for the flight, uh, flight fuselage. So all of those sorts of things are coming together perfectly right now. The other thing we've obviously allowed for, as I've mentioned in the past, is we do still have room for various types of vibration absorber within the donut on the top of the, the rotor system. So another, another key area of the program that's crucial to making sure that HX50 doesn't just perform right, but it feels right. We have to get the ride and the vibration and the handling qualities uh, to the right level for the very first aerial Grand Tourer. Let's talk briefly about the digital cockpit. So uh, there's still a range of features that haven't been rolled out in the latest version of the, the Digi Cockpit, uh, and more of these features have been developed over the course of the, the last few weeks. So some of those are the startup page, so how you initially interact with the Digi Cockpit, how you manage the engine start process, uh, and how uh, all of that is, is linked together with both the app and everything else. So we've been doing a bunch of work on the startup sequence. We've also now developed out the way that the uh, navigation Navigation routes from your electronic flight book uh, are synchronized with the flight control computer on the aircraft uh, and how that's communicated via the digi cockpit to the pilot. Uh, and then we're about to start some user experience and user interface 
piloted trials using uh, the simulator. So we'll shortly be reaching out to some experimental test pilots on the technical side and also a few uh, people from within the, the pilot community, our customer community, to, to come and do some structured tests for various use, use cases for the DigiCockpit. So let's talk about the startup sequence briefly. Um, fundamentally, when you start up HX50, you'll have a welcome page. The welcome page gives you all of the key information that you need to support uh, your, your walk around and to make the go, no go flight decision. Have you got enough fuel? Is the battery fully charged? Uh, and then once you've done that, it gives you the opportunity to log in so that all of the automatic flight tracking that links your hours, the aircraft's hours to the hill cloud is logged to your, uh, your account. Once you move into that, we're then developing out a startup page which helps you quickly navigate the the checklists you can remove all of that if you when you become proficient enough not to to need it uh, and then it also expands out the first limit indicator to give you your n1 rpm your measured uh, gas temperature and also your uh, your torque as separate gauges for the, the startup process. When you're higher in the startup process and the other flight instruments start to become more important, you have the ability to toggle that information onto the first limit indicator. Again, all of these features are very much in development at the moment. They're not finalized, but I thought I'd give you an update so that you understood that this stuff is coming. Uh, the other area, as I've indicated, is the handshake between the digital cockpit and the electronic flight book that allows you to identify that the correct route has been synced with the flight control computer and then to accept or reject that because the, uh, the digital cockpit itself doesn't carry mapping capability. So we have to have that handshake between the two so that you can see the, the system is going to follow the route that you expect. What you can see in the top of that figure is the little pop-up menu uh, that allows you to see that the shape of your route and the start and end point details match what you've got on your iPad and then you can accept that or reject it as, re as required. Um, the final area that we've been working on, uh, which is an area that's of particular interest to, to me, is making sure that we take every opportunity uh, to fully harness and exploit the uh, benefits of modern LED technology within our lighting clusters. So in the presentations of the aircraft you've seen, you will have noticed that we have these automotive style lighting clusters on the wingtips and on the nose of the aircraft. While that is part of the signature look of the aircraft, it's also absolutely crucial to expanding the capability and the safety of operating HX and HC50 at night. The wingtip landing light systems give you a broader spread of illumination of the ground and then the nose landing light gives you a dual focus to help you identify landing sites under normal approach conditions and emergency conditions. What we're in the process of doing at the moment is doing some uh, tests of the lighting modules that we've built to demonstrate just what the art of the possible is. How much illumination can we really provide and where should we pitch the intensity level of these lights for best effect. And what I'm particularly interested with exploring there is whether we can get the level of illumination from the landing lights uh, to, to the level that it's going to give you early enough decision making in the event of an auto rotation at night and the extent to which we can illuminate uh, landing areas in low light levels as well for enhanced safety of VFR night flying. So those tests are scheduled to happen uh, not next week but the week after and we'll be reporting the, the results of that and showing you just what this lighting system is going to enable you to do in your HX50. So at that point I'll uh, pause for breath uh, and be happy to receive any questions that you may have on uh, any area of the programme. Thank you. All right. uh, me. There we go. Me uh, so yeah, we've got you. Sorry we didn't hear you for a second. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks again for another great update. Uh, lots of things to be watching here. We have a lot of questions that have come in, and if you guys haven't had a chance to post a question yet, make sure you do put that on the chat uh, so that we can pose that to, to Jason, and we'll get that answered for you today. Um, Jason, the first one is from Brian, and a um, bit of a general question. Understanding that things can change, can you give us an update on the current production and fielding schedule? 
Yeah, so that we haven't changed that at the moment. So we clearly we're just getting into the uh, the interesting part of the program where we're building stuff and testing stuff. But as it stands at the moment, uh, the key points on the timeline are uh, engine running by the middle of this year. We're aiming for first flight uh, of PP1 by the end of this year. That does require everything to go to plan. Uh, and then we roll into uh, through the approvals process for the X. So this, this simplified approvals process we've got over the course of next year while we configure uh, PC1 and probably a couple of other rented spaces as well for production. So we're still slated to, to enter production at the end of 25 into 26. Uh, you Same you thing muted, Ruben. With you and we can't hear you. <laughs> okay, I'll uh, I'll go ahead and ask uh, Ruben's question. So uh, JP is asking. It's kind of a follow-up, similar th uh, type question. So when will the prototypes roll out? Uh, what I know is supposed to be 2024, but any estimated month-wise? Uh, no, I mean, all I can really say with any confidence at the moment is we're, uh, we, we have it, we'll have that roll out in the final quarter of, of this year. At the moment, we're very focused on uh, getting all the final updates into the fuselage so that we can release the tooling. Then we've got about a four month period of tooling production to be able to produce the, the flight fuselages. The mechanical systems in terms of the drivetrain and the rotor head are in a slightly better position because you don't need tooling for them. Um, but all of those need to be built in the probably Q2, Q3 of this year and then tested on the, the ground. So it's all about subsystem testing during the, uh, the middle of this year in parallel with the engine. And then we build uh, the, the first flying prototype right towards the end of this year. Okay. Do we have you now, Ruben? Nope, maybe not. Jay's asking a question um, about production beginning. So uh, ramp up of production. Um, when do you think, let's say, the first 100 serial numbers would be delivered? So, so these are all kind so of the, uh, all similar. Uh, yeah. Similar so the the, uh, the the approach we're taking to production is we've removed ourselves from the constraints of planning and, and building buildings. Uh, and once we've got through the development and we're into uh, or we're into the scale up phase and the, the approvals phase, we will reconfigure PC1 for production. PC1 is likely to either be the composite production facility or the machine shop, one of the two in its production configuration. configuration. We'll then take on a second production center that handles uh, the machining and also the assembly uh, of all of those operations. And that still gives us the ability to enter production with a target for year one of 475 uh, aircraft. And then year two will go to 675, year three up to 1,000. Okay, excellent. And um, my audio now, Misha. Good. Go ahead, Ruben. Yeah, we're right. with Ben's question. I think now. that we, exactly, Ben, okay, great. Yeah. So Ben is asking um, HX50 on wheels. Um, what is the plan for the app for moving on the ground? But also, uh, will it be an alternative to a way to move it without the app or without the uh, the heli move uh, tow cart or tow bar? And also about the shipping. So he has two questions. That one and the next one is about the shipping to the US. Uh, ben is concerned about what happened to the uh, our um, helicopter wing going to HAI and what could be avoided on his own shipment. Okay, so let's let's use HX50 on wheels. Uh, let's talk about how to move it on the ground. Clearly, you've got the puck and the the app to to move it around with a heli move system. If you use that, if you don't have heli move, then there's a selection of hard points around the aircraft that allow you to push it or tow it as you would with any other aircraft. The nose gear in its current configuration already has the the pickup points uh, for a tow bar, which you could pull by hand or you could pull with a little uh, tow cart. So th those provisions are are already already part of the, the, the design and they will continue whether you have heli move or not. You'll always need the ability to position it manually. So that, that's, uh, that's already embedded in the, the design. In terms of, of shipping, you have to rem remember that the, the airframes that we've shown uh, so far are airframes that have been produced from our process development tools. So these don't have all of the features uh, that will be in the production tools that we're developing at the, the moment. So tight 
tie down points uh, and all of the other provisions that you need for proper shipping. Um, the, these fuselages were really about demonstrating the ability to produce this carbon uh, fuselage in the way that we wanted to, for the price we wanted to, with the properties that we wanted. And so all of that stuff's got to, got to be built in. Um, the issue with shipping uh, the machines that we, the two machines that you've seen at Duxford and, and in the US, is they were never designed to be shipped. You know, we never intended to use these uh, as ground demonstrators. They, they've already uh, uh, been used way beyond their intention. Um, so the, the shipping uh, is, a, is designed in to the, the next generation fuselage, which is the one that will fly. So there will be a very robust uh, uh, and secure way of shipping these aircraft around the world. And we'll be working with the, the best partners in the, the business to securely ship these machines wherever you want them. So don't worry about that. That's very much our problem. Uh, and the, the issue that we had with the green one is, is very much a case of shipping last minute because Heli Expo was too close to our own event uh, and trying to ship something that uh, was never really intended to be broken down and shipped in the way that we shipped it. Uh, and the other thing to say, of course, is it's uh, from from what's been done to it, it has seen an absolutely astronomical load. So uh, that wouldn't be an aircraft that would be flying if it was a, uh, a full flight aircraft. Okay. And Samet has a question. Um, how is your automated software quality? Can you give information about your software standards? Uh, that's not really my area, but we, we developed the, the software to full certified uh, standards using all of the, uh, I think it's DO178 and 2 something something, I can't remember off the top of my head. Uh, we, we, we put all of the software through a full certification and approvals process. We use all of the software checking tools and follow all current industry best practice. That's really a question for, for Eric. Okay. Charles is asking, where is uh, PC1 located? Uh, it's in Stafford. So it's literally two minutes away from Junction 14 on the M6. Okay. Easy answer there. Ali is asking, I don't know if this has been addressed before. Who is the partner company for the avionics? Surely uh, you're not developing yours from the ground up. <laughs> uh, we didn't want to develop them from the ground up, but we've we've had to, unfortunately. So yeah, the uh, the avionics is essentially uh, ours. Uh, we have a, a partner that provides the uh, an aviation grade real time operating system. We have a partner that provides a certified aviation grade. Uh, uh, graphics uh, driver and then we have a partner that provides a platform for digital instrumentation and, and uh, GUI uh, design again aviation grade and fully certifiable we've then developed over the top of it the hill uh, digital cockpit interface that you can see that's all ours that's all our our work uh, and then in terms of the, the source boxes, so the comm radios, uh, the transponder, the GPS source are all remote mount boxes that come from TRIG. Uh, we've got a PS engineering audio panel that's again controlled by us uh, and a few other bits and pieces. So the actual avionic remote mount boxes, we are buying those in at the moment, uh, but everything else is essentially ours. And, and again, that's just about giving big glass, the user interface that we want for HX50, but at a price that the program can afford. Gideon is asking the next question. Uh, with a 1,300 helicopter backlog, yet that expected delivery date, if you order today, of around 2027, that means 36 aircraft a month, uh, 433 a year, if you start this year. I'm not sure if this math is exactly right, but that's what the question is asking. Uh, given that Robinson built uh, around 300 helicopters a year, Airbus uh, 395, that's a big scale up rate. How will you manage that? And just to clarify right now, if you order uh, with the current uh, backlog of the X, we're expecting end of 2027, probably beginning of 2028. So that's just a clarification there about the dates. But go ahead to, about the uh, production capacity and rate uh, with the current order book that we have, Jason. So 500 a year or 1,000 a year is not a big number in manufacturing. The, the numbers that other aircraft manufacturers manufacture is set by their demand. It isn't because they can't make more, it's because they don't need to make any more. Uh, if you look at rest uh, Robinson's historical results, Robinson peaked at production at 894 aircraft a year. Out of just 260,000 square foot, I think they peaked at about 
704, if I remember my numbers rightly. Um, the the current uh, demand, uh, sorry, the current production rate um, is it really a, a reflection of demand, and in particular at the moment, it's the availability of some of the parts from suppliers. When you set about designing a, a factory from a clean sheet of paper and designing an aircraft from a clean sheet of paper to be production friendly within the palette of processes that you want to use, you can design that factory uh, to make as many as you want. So if, for example, we talk about gears, let me give you a gear as an example. If I want to make a gear, I think this one takes about four hours on that machine, okay? So I can make 24 divided by four, I can make six of these a day on that machine. If I want to make 60, I buy 10 of those machines. That's scale up, okay? Now, obviously, the logistics get more complicated. Um, the more parts you've got to make and the assembly and the more people you have to involve. But fundamentally, if you look at other manufacturers, Toyota make 13 million cars a year. So these numbers aren't big. It is a huge undertaking, don't get me wrong, but we design, we've designed, we are designing our production facilities and everything that goes around it to make the scale up as easy as possible. Uh, we're designing all of the processes to use the least skilled labor that we possibly can, relying on advanced machines, advanced robotics, as much uh, automation and clever process design as we can um, to enable us to scale without being bottlenecked by people as much as some of the other companies have been in the past uh, and also we're just setting our stall out to start at 500 with a capacity to grow to a thousand a year if you do that by design then the scale-up can be manufactured uh, then the scale-up can be managed okay and that's very good um, Gideon is asking if there are delays in the to the GT50 development will you consider using let's say an Arius family engine to get a prototype flying this year uh, no, it, it doesn't help us. It's a, it's a non-starter. That engine is far too expensive for our, uh, our program. Uh, it has different uh, connections in terms of the, the drive shaft speeds, in terms of the way it's mounted, in terms of its control uh, applications. So it would be a whole engineering project just to integrate uh, an engine into a carbon fuselage that's been molded. Uh, and tooled um, just to uh, just to, to accelerate it um, and I, I don't necessarily think there'd be a material acceleration I think the best use of resources and the the, the most uh, the long-term quickest way to get this done is just to do it right okay so we're going to get GT50 to work and then we're going to put it in the in the aircraft so I don't think there's a benefit in going to a, another engine at all okay. Barry's asking I'm not sure Oh, do you want to carry on for a second? So I'll pick it up. So Barry's just asking, not sure if this has been addressed previously, but will the baggage door have a strut to hold it open? This is a common yeah. question. Yeah, it will. Um, and we, we're looking at a couple of things with that baggage door. One of the one of the considerations that we'd, we, we've been looking at is whether we can actually lift it vertically as well. Um, but that, had, that causes us other problems, but there'll definitely be a gas strut to hold it open and prop it open. Uh, there was actually a gas strut uh, a configuration designed for the two machines that we showed at Duxford, but we just didn't have time uh, to implement it because we needed to make a bunch of other modifications to the, the, the structures to accept it. Gas struts are, gas struts are lovely, but the problem with them is they create very large point loads. So you have to have enough stiffness in your structure locally to be able to, to handle them when you close them. Exactly. Good. Paul's asking a question. Does the blade tip geometry, has it been optimized? to allow best angle of attack or blade stall? Uh, which blades are we talking about? Main rotor blades? I believe it's main rotor blades, yeah. Yeah, the whole rotor geometry has been uh, optimized aerodynamically really, really carefully. So it's been optimized to give low noise, uh, manageable control loads, and the best balance of performance that we can get across all of the, the conditions that we need. What you find is that everything that's good for you in hover is bad in forward flight, uh, and everything that you want to do to go faster or to reduce the power is going to hurt your control loads. And so it's a very delicate balance aerodynamically to get those blades uh, to the 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 least worst position is probably the best way to describe it. And then the structural dynamic optimization is a whole new level uh, because you're then trying to 
replace the natural frequencies that the blade wants to naturally oscillate at to minimize uh, the, the shear forces and the, the moments that are transmitted to the, to the hub uh, to help control your, your vibration and your, your stability. So it's been optimized for a lot of things and it's received a lot of attention. Next question is from Leon. Uh, I would love to get an insight into how simulators uh, could help development and design decisions, such as uh, such as FEM, uh, CFD. Uh, which simulations are performed, and how advanced are the models in terms of accuracy compared to the upcoming tests? Yeah, so I mean, the, I, I don't know how many people are aware, but dynamic engineering, my previous business, was an FEA and CFD and modeling specialist organization. We used to apply those techniques to basically every industry you could imagine. Um, and so the whole development of HX50 and GT50 uh, has been extensively uh, using finite element modeling for all areas, statics, dynamics, crash, modal, uh, structural dynamics, um, the, the blade, uh, the main rotor design and the flight dynamics use an extensive range of multi-physics tools. So we use a comprehensive uh, analysis tool to couple uh, wake simulation with blade aerodynamics, with um, blade structural dynamics and a bunch of other stuff just to get the rotor performance. And then we couple that with a flight mechanics model to get the handling qualities and various other interactions. And all of these things interact with each other uh, and pass information up and down the, the model hierarchy. So we've got a very, 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 very sophisticated uh, suite of models behind the development of this program uh, that give us a great deal of, of confidence um, that we're not going to have any, we're not going to have too many nasty surprises uh, during the, the test program. And of course, the way that the program, if you take the gears as, a, as another great example, so we, there's lots of sort of in, empirical based and fundamental based methods in the, the gear design standards that we use. We then use finite element analysis to look at the body of the gear and some interaction characteristics with the supporting structure to get the contact patch, uh, patches right, the interaction of the, the gear loads with the casings and the mountings. And then we go and do individual gear tests to validate that the data that we put into those models is what we think it is. And when you bring all of those things together and then test progressively, you can have a very high degree of confidence that you're going to get broadly what you, uh, you expect when you test these things. Very nice. I love hearing those explanations. It's good to hear. Um, Timothy is asking, is there an inlet barrier filter for the engine to handle dust and snow? Yes. So that's, uh, that's engine mounted at present, but we're looking at, as, as I mentioned in the presentation, we're, we're having a, a, a final cut through the whole engine installation at the moment uh, and looking at how we uh, channel air through the engine bay, how we ventilate the engine bay, and whether we can do anything clever with those flow paths to provide additional, uh, additional uh, protection. But fundamentally, yes, the, the engine has an inlet barrier filter. From Canada, Steve uh, is asking, are you performing incidental shock testing of components when running, uh, simulating a significant shock to the aircraft, say, during a hard landing to ensure there is no cascading failures? I noted that other manufacturers have had uh, to re-engineer to accommodate incidental shocks. Airbus has now included uh, incidental shock mitigation in individual unit components test regimes. Yeah, we have a we have a uh, a very comprehensive approach to all of the structural dynamic uh, design of the the airframe. So we look at we look at the basic crash loads, but we also look at heavy landings. We also look at all of the other things that can create uh, shock and transient loads that are realistically manageable within a, an aircraft that's got to be designed to be light enough to fly. Um, we analyze as much as we can, but the, the thing you have to manage is if you're not careful, you end up with a, a load book with so many different cases uh, that it becomes intractable. 
Uh, and so we have a, a rational set of load cases that we think envelope everything uh, that's likely to happen to the aircraft. And then obviously we'll be extensively testing the, uh, the flight airframes before they go flying. So we'll have a, a test rig on the ground to conduct all of the static and fatigue tests. We'll be conducting drop tests to verify the fuel system integrity and the, the crash testing. And then we'll also have a, an instrumented fuselage where we can look at some of these more uh, spurious and outlying cases as well. Nice. James asking a question, a little more clarity on the co-builder process. When in the timeline do the, uh, does the owner go for the 51% of the HX50 build? Is it the final two weeks of the production with the helicopter being at the end of the two weeks or is it somewhere in the middle? No, it's the final, it's essentially the final two weeks. Um, and remember, the, there's things that you have to do on your aircraft, but there's other things that we're putting into the program to, to make you a, a well-rounded and well-educated owner-operator. So you'll be able to go and see how transmissions are built and how gears are built and how turbine engines are built and how the rotor heads are built. That doesn't have to be yours because they're all identical and they're all built by us. But you, you can access those additional parts of the program out of sync with when your particular unit was built because obviously all of those things will have been in done in advance of, uh, of your aircraft nearing final assembly. So you'll be involved in your actual fuselage and those, those sorts of things clearly, but things like your gearbox and your, your engine will have been, been built a little way before. So you'll, you'll get to witness uh, and be involved in the process of the next one uh, that's coming down the line so that we can synchronize that program to give you the, the most rounded educational experience we can. Another question from Leon. Uh, will the GT50 be tested with the SAF uh, from the start, as there are certainly differences in the combustion of, I believe, standard aircraft fuel compared to kerosene? Uh, yes, it will. Sustainable. Sustainable. Yeah, sustainable. Fuel. Yeah. Yes, it will. Yeah. It will. Okay. Answered. All right. Jason, this is probably a naive question. This is my question. Is there a difference, uh, and I think there is, but a difference between uh, SAF, so sustainable uh, aviation fuel, and biodiesel, or uh, like synthetic biodiesel, or are they similar or the same? Uh, no, diesel is a different kind of fuel uh, altogether. So the, the sustainable aviation fuel that, uh, that we're envisaging using for GT50 is a, a, a fuel that's derived from a cellulistic source of ethanol. So it's a process that allows you to essentially use all of the cellulose-based uh, matter in, the, uh, in the, the plant. So you don't waste anything. We can use waste products from food crops and things like that. Um, then they synthesize ethanol, and then from the ethanol, they can synthesize uh, a compound that's extremely similar to conventional jet fuel chemically. Uh, there are subtle differences in where the, the underlying hydrocarb hydrocarbons come from and the, the mix of molecules that are in that fraction, but fundamentally it's extremely close to conventional jet fuel. Sustainable aviation fuel is different in that it's jet fuel mixed with all sorts of other stuff uh, that's waste products from from other other industries to repurpose and to uh, uh, to, uh, to 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 reduce the the carbon impact. So that is much more complicated because you've got a much wider range of chemicals and molecules and things within that that blend that has to be managed by the fuel system in the in the engine. So we have a slightly simpler uh, route to that from the the engine's point of view. Okay, excellent. Uh, James is asking, how much better energy absorption performance will there be having the wheeled version uh, versus the skids version for crash performance? Uh, there shouldn't be a great deal of difference in it because the, the skids and the wheels don't, gener don't uh, absorb a lot of energy beyond the standard landing loads. They're designed to, to move out of the way. It's the carbon tub and the stroking seats that provide most of the protection in those, those situations. So it really doesn't make a difference for you. I think there'd be a, th there's a potential of a subtle difference in the, the crash dynamics, so how the aircraft behaves if it's struck on soft ground, for example, with wheels versus skids. So there'll be some things in the pilot operating handbook to advise on what to do there. Uh, if you were going into a ploughed field, I don't think I'd recommend you put the wheels down, for example. Okay. All right. Then Ruben, you want to ask the next question? I think we might have lost them there again. Okay, so JL is asking, is there any sort of reinjection or hot air 
out of the downstream of the combustion chambers into the cold compressed airflow. It is, is it recirculated, uh, bringing about five to 10% performance down? So th there's always a risk of re-ingestion of your exhaust gases uh, with a helicopter, particularly in the, the hover. Uh, and that's something that's managed as part of the, uh, the engine installation and the, the flight test program. Um, again, the so you can get you can do some analysis um, with with modern CFD and comprehensive uh, type analysis, but uh, rotor, trying to do a CFD analysis on a highly vortical uh, rotor wake is an extremely difficult task, and so I wouldn't necessarily uh, rely on those sorts of anal analytical results anyway. So it's a possibility. It's something we'll have to deal with on test. It's a problem that's been solved in lots of other helicopters before. Yeah. Okay, I think the next one is from Steve, correct, uh, Misha? Is yep. it Steve? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. So beyond the anti-resonant mounting, uh, since you reworked the airframe tooling to modify the engine's position, have you been able to accommodate the dynamic mounting shocks for the gearbox that was contemplated as a possible as a possible future? Uh, if, no. Uh, not yet. That, that's not a technology that we're prepared to entertain until we've got the aircraft uh, uh, into service. So there's a, there's a whole suite of technologies that we have available to us uh, to manage the vibration with HX50. So the intention, like with everything that we've done with the aircraft, is to get the basics right first. So the first thing you do is you design your, your composite rotor blades correctly to minimize uh, the structural dynamic loads, uh, the aeroelastic loads that go back to the airframe uh, and back down into the hub. You then develop a, a kinematically correct rotor mounting. So you've got your focal points in the right place. You've got your mounting in the right place, all your center percussion set up properly. Uh, then we use our anti-resonant mounts to make sure that the loads that do come down through the, the rotor are isolated to the best extent possible. And then beyond that, there are some clever things that we can do with the way we control the, the rotor pitch to limit the amount of vibration to a next level. If we're still struggling after that, then you'd be looking at inertial dampers, uh, pendulums, bifilers up on the, the hub uh, to try and tune out particular problem frequencies. Um, and that will be our approach for entry to service. And, and um, I don't expect us to go any further than that in the short term. Going to an active system is perfectly feasible. There's lots of ways to do it, but it is an order of magnitude more complicated and it would just serve to, uh, to bog us down. What, what I will uh, say is that I would have every intention of making sure that swapping out the mounting struts with active struts would be possible uh, in the future. It's been contemplated now as, a, as a giving you a route to upgrade in the future, but it's absolutely not something that we're gonna, gonna do now. We've, we've got enough on our plate as it is. Okay, good. And David's asking a question. Um, a critical factor in the scaling process of any project is the workforce. How many more people will you require and where do you intend to find them from, ensuring that they're the right fit for us? So uh, again, remember making, uh, we, we're going to need a workforce of about 500 people at the start of production, so 500 additional people, and I think that will rapidly scale to about a thousand people. Now, uh, the Midlands, or the middle of the, the UK, is, a, is an area with a very rich engineering background. There are, there are lots of engineering employers in the area, um, and, and quite frankly, we make a very exciting product uh, and can offer a very exciting employment proposition. So I, I know from my own uh, career in engineering in this area the the workforce is here uh, it's why we're here or one of the reasons why we're here so yes getting skilled people and getting people with the right mindset is difficult um, drawing them to a, a new employer is difficult uh, but we have uh, an incredible offer to, to these people. We make an incredible product uh, it's an, an amazing place to, to work and in the grand scale of things, in relative to the size of the workforce in the area, we don't need that many people. So again, these are manageable problems. It's up, it's up to us to make ourselves as attractive as possible. Can the, Ricardo is asking, can the front LED light have an option to use as a strobe light? Strobe lights are being used to avoid bird strikes? That's a question. 
Yes, I have promised that function to customer number one. Uh, so yes, that will definitely be uh, a function that, that's available. At the moment, as I said, I'm focusing very much on uh, how hard we want to drive those LEDs and tuning the optics that sit over the individual LEDs to pitch the illumination level at the, the best possible point. That then drives what goes on on the back of those modules to deliver enough cooling to get the reliability of them to where we need them to be. So that's what I'm focused on at the moment, but there's no reason why we couldn't strobe that or, or alternate it like the, the bird scare lights do that that's perfectly practical the the existing architecture facilitates that okay, excellent I just have a quick follow-up question that got asked to me times when we were at HAI on the lighting the the side strip lighting when you're on the ground and the aircraft's not um, uh, powered up so it's not running uh, will it be possible to change that to different colors of lighting uh, it is technically possible. They are multicolor LEDs that are in there. So that is possible. Uh, there's a whole chunk of work going on with those, those strips at the moment. Um, there may be a function that we add to allow them to both be white. So they can provide uh, area lighting for departures at, at night from from um, uh, areas with, with low light levels and things like that. There's also uh, functions that we haven't revealed yet for when you approach the aircraft and how the aircraft handshakes with you and things like that. So there's a whole host of fun stuff to come with those lights. They're very flexible systems. Okay, excellent. And then I'll ask Connor's question. Connor is um, 800 and serial number 859. Uh, he's incredible. Uh, he says incredible progress. I'm in awe every time I tune into the progress. It's so positive and refreshing. Might be a stupid question, but I want to do some wild camping in remote areas and wondering if there'd be the capability to charge an auxiliary battery while you're flying. Uh, it's not something I've thought about. Um, I can consider it. Uh, we've got the, the starter generator is a 10 kilowatt starter generator uh, and under normal operations the, the system doesn't use anything like that. So it's, it's certainly a, a possibility. Uh, there are USB-C outlets throughout the, the fuselage as you will have seen at HI in Duxford. Uh, so if it's charging from uh, a USB-C port definitely. Um, uh, I don't think we've actually put one in yet but there'll almost certainly be the uh, the, the cigarette lighter port as well for, for those sorts of applications. So anything that requires those definitely uh, beyond that, we'd have to think about it more, more carefully. Now the question from Lupi, is the engine exhaust vertically, vertically above the real pylon? Somehow on the side, the rotor is pushing, would help to, the rotor pushing would help to keep paint in a good shape. So, uh, the, the exhaust is an area that's going to receive a little bit more attention once we've got the basic engine running on the bench. Um, the, the exhaust is intended and is designed to throw the, the exhaust over one side of the boom. And we're trying to arrange some baffles in the, the exhaust so that the combination of the velocity from the wake and also the exhaust uh, geometry will miss the boom and miss the horizontal stabilizer. We're unlikely to get that perfect in all conditions, but clearly we don't want the hot exhaust moving over the top of the, uh, the boom or hitting the vertical fin. Um, so like a lot of other helicopters, it will be thrown over to the, the one side to try and miss the boom. I think I've said in previous okay. updates as well, we are looking at some paint treatments and some coatings uh, to, to try and make it more difficult for the, 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 the waste oil and the, the soot uh, to attach to the boom. But again, that's pretty low down on the priorities list at the moment. We will come to it because I'm fed up of cleaning soot off tail booms of helicopters. Okay. Martin's asking, uh, did you consider fitting the seats in a motor vehicle to be able to test comfort over many hours of driving miles? <laughs> We're in the process of fitting the seats to office chairs at the moment to test the comfort of the, uh, the chairs with the very people that designed them. <laughs> so yeah, we are <laughs> doing long-term tests at the moment. The, I, 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 I could have spoken for a long period on the, on the seats. It's actually, the, the essence of designing a seat is very simple but uh, the detail of it is really difficult because it's so subjective. And if you sit a bunch of different people in a seat, they'll sit there and they'll think, yeah, 
it's fine it's it's comfortable it's not a, that's not the same as sitting in a seat for five hours um and so we we need to to do some some sanity checking with longer periods of, a, of exposure with the, the seat the other thing that you've got to be aware of is the way a seat's used in a helicopter is very different to the way a seat's used in a car because you don't have sideways forces in a in a helicopter uh, everything's straight down through your through your backside um and so uh, flattening off the the lateral support that you get in a in a car gives us opportunities to allow you to to reposition uh, much more readily, which is a key part of being able to keep comfortable over a long period of time. So so yeah, we are we are doing a lot of uh, a lot of additional testing at the moment to make sure we get that just right. The the key disadvantage we've got actually is the the fact that we need a single one size fits all seat. Uh, the 19 way adjustable seats in my car make it easy for everybody of any shape and size to get comfortable. We can't do that in a helicopter, unfortunately. Peter from South Africa is asking an interesting question, as other ones were as well. A South African engineer who viewed the HS50 at HAI noted a concern that the gearbox may not get enough cooling due to the fear in of the cowling. Uh, can Jason play, please comment on this? No, there's a very there's a very sophisticated uh, ducting system that's going into those cowls. Uh, none of that has been shown to anybody yet. So we have to we have to pump air through the cowling. We have to ven ventilate the gearbox, gearbox heat exchanger, engine oil heat exchanger, starter generator uh, needs active uh, needs active cooling as well. And the the whole mass flow through the power, the, the cowling is really important. Otherwise, it'll just get too hot in there. Um, so there's a bunch of stuff that you haven't seen yet. Um, that uh, is, is designed to ensure all of those things are, are managed properly. So, and again, uh, a, uh, a lack of cooling will show itself up on the test bench almost immediately. Um, so we, we've got that covered, don't worry. And can you expand that same thing sure. up to the Donut Hub? Um, because that's been asked on the, about the Donut Hub as well, because it's kind of relatively novel that uh, people close in that entire hub. Are there, is there anything up there that needs cooling? Not really, right? Uh, well, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. The the bits the bits that flex and move will need some cooling, not a great deal, but they'll need some. Um, but you've got to remember, it it looks pretty airtight, but it still leaks like a sieve. It's not difficult to to get air into that thing. Um, and there are a couple of uh, carefully engineered cooling passages in there that we'll be detailing out and expanded, uh, expanding as we go through the test program. So yeah, the 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 cooling for the hub and the cooling for everything under the cowls is subject to very careful engineering it's not we haven't just covered it up and forgotten about it don't worry okay steve is asking may have asked this uh, question before or made the suggestion before for eric uh, could you use a sound designer to craft a hill signature get attention tone uh, anytime that the state has changed and the pilot needs to have their attention to acknowledge something or to make an input yeah we can so the um the benefit of doing stuff yourself and the, the benefit of having your own software is you can do what you want, right? Um, but it's a, it's a question of priorities at the moment. At the moment, I need to, to get the remaining functions implemented into the Digi Cockpit. We need to get all of that ported to the certif certified grade software stack. And then we need to get that on the hardware and get it functionally tested and then verified. Once we've got that core suite, we've got something that we can take flying and we've got something that we can deliver. In the background, we have lots of opportunities to enhance features. We've got all of the IFR stuff to go and do at a later date. Um, and then there's all sorts of themes that we can modify with the digi cockpit and rolling out different looks and feels doing things that suit people from different backgrounds uh, a little bit better there's a whole bunch of stuff like that that we can do but right now we're very focused on minimum viable product and getting this thing in the air and then into production bells and whistles will be later right that's yeah a good priority list yeah Let's get the Christmas right, tree Rodrigo, ready before we decorate uh, it. <laughs> yeah. Rodrigo is asking, I saw on the last slide, the Starflex on the main rotor, is it hollow? The Starflex on the main rotor, did he say? That's mm. what it's written. Yes. Yeah, so that's that's not a Starflex. Those are those are strap packs. So those those are, are laminations of at the moment stainless steel, and they just flex like uh, like the the hub of some of the uh, the Hughes products. So that that's that's just a, a tension torsion strap. It's not a Starflex. Okay. 
Very good. And Brian is asking, did you consider 3D print? Actually, can you, uh, before I ask the question, can you just make a note on that? What will be the life cycle of that strap pack? Because a lot of people are, are, are looking at it saying, is this like a TT strap that needs to be swapped out every two years or something? Um, no. what, what's your uh, life on that? Like, like, like everything else, they're, they're warranted for 5,000 hours. Okay. All right. Uh, so Brian's question, did you uh, consider 3D printing for the annular combustor with some post-machining amongst other metal, metal parts? What are the limitations from your perspective on not being able to employ this method? So the, the main challenge with 3D printing is that the process is very slow. So as a, and the machines currently are very expensive. Um, and, and so they're not productive. So in terms of a production process, uh, some, of, some of these machines, we looked at some recently, and uh, the, the metal printing ones are, are about 800,000 pounds, but they print so slowly that you'd have to amortize that capital cost over a very small number of parts. Now, that will improve over years, but it's not there yet, and it's, a, it's an order of magnitude different in terms of what it would cost to make an annular combustor like that over what we can make an annular combustor using these more traditional methods. Make no mistake, the, this stuff that I've shown you over here today is, is horrible from a development point of view. It's taken ages. Uh, the guys have had to work really hard in just fettling and tweaking and tuning these processes. But once we've done it, the machines that we need to make those combustors are trivially inexpensive and the processes are really fast. We shape those components in moments on the, the rolling machine that we've shown you before was 14 grand. OK, and it can make those rings in about 14 seconds. You know, it's really, really quick and inexpensive. It's not that labor intensive. So that is the right way to, to do it. If I could come up with a, a combustion geometry that didn't need all these interleaves, that would be the way to make life simpler. But casting it is a non-starter. It'd be, it'd just be too heavy. Uh, and you, you can't make the geometry you need because the lips have, have to, um, overlap each other so that you get the film cooling over both sides of the uh, well certainly on the flame side of the combustion liner otherwise the the flame would just hot corrode and kill the metal very quickly so you don't have a lot of choices in how you can make this um, there are applications for 3d printing so the uh, the annular the combustion um, casing that I showed you was 3d printed uh, the material quality in that is better than a casting but the raw material itself is about three times the price of what we, uh, we, what we uh, pay for cast stock. Uh, and then the process itself is really slow and requires really expensive materials, uh, sorry, machines. So they're not production processes. They're great for prototyping. They're great for what they say, but they're not production processes for any meaningful volumes. Okay. All right, before I present the next question, uh, we're gonna take ownership of the, uh, this one before. We see a couple of comments, uh, Jason, after you have actually explained the production capacity, but they keep on coming, uh, which is uh, there are some people that just don't believe that's realistic to produce uh, 400 aircraft in one year. So you just gave an example of the how quickly a part can be made and how different systems are being applied to different parts and then integrating those. Can you just clarify a little bit more? I just want to give another chance because there's this idea that 400 aircraft a year is immense. It's impossible. Uh, we have several comments here that it's not realistic. Uh, I think that we should clarify this coming from you again, and then I'll, I'll go back to the to the question thread. But this is an important one. I think that the single most important thing to understand is the uh, a production facility will design. Uh, sorry, will manufacture whatever number or capacity of things you want it to but you have to design it to do that and then you have to have the the funding and you have to have the resources to put enough machines and enough people there to be able to execute that clearly recruiting enough people to fill a factory of that size is demanding we've got to start that early enough when we know we're ready for them you can't start it too early because if you've got all those people standing around and all those facilities standing around before you're ready to produce it'll kill you financially so we've got to time that correctly but it, the, the key is the main advantage that we've got over people that have trodden this path before is the fact that because we've had such 
uh, success with our pre-sales campaign, we know what the demand is. We know how big we've got to make this factory. We're not getting to the end of a stealth development, having no idea what the demand for the product's going to be, and then speculatively building a factory of modest capacity so we don't overstretch, and then trying to organically grow that um, uh, as you're trying to produce. Clearly, if you did that, it's going to take a decade, okay? But if you set out from the word go to build a production facility to make any number uh, of aircraft, then as long as you've got the, the financial means uh, and you can recruit enough people, you can do it. There will be a ramp up. You're not going to turn it on at 475, but we're turning on a factory that's designed to do a thousand and hitting 475 in, in year one. And not all of those machines are going to be at the, produced at the right rate at month one. It'll grow throughout the, the course of the year. But you've got to let us develop out the detail of the manufacturing process uh, to be able to put tighter dates on that. So I still um, am absolutely resolute that you design a factory uh, with the right capacity, it will produce that capacity. If you don't know what the capacity is because you develop your machine in stealth and then started selling it on the day it was ready, then you've got to take a guess at what your capacity is and it will be wrong and it will be on the small side. That's why we've historically seen these slow ramp ups. Uh, we're in a different position because we know how many of them we've got to build. So the factory that we're designing, the factory that we're building, the facilities that we're putting in place now are designed to give us the best possible position to uh, ramp up to that production rate as fast as is possible. Super clear. Thank you. That was great, uh, Jason. Thank you for that. Uh, I'll answer the next one and then there's another question after. It's about the first one about uh, flight simulator availability. Is there any plans to have it available until the end of the year? Uh, we can tell you that it's very well advanced and we're just waiting for the confirmation of the flight dynamics uh, uh, to release that indefinitely before the end of the year. Now, Piers is asking, can you tell more about the server actuators? Yeah, so uh, the servo actuators uh, are quite clever in HX50. So it's a, a modern dual sleeve arrangement. So we're protected against uh, spool valve jam and the servo jam itself. Uh, beyond that, it's a very conventional uh, simplex servo. So it, uh, a conventional layout of the, the sloppy link, manual reversion, but with the modern, the modern levels of uh, failure mode tolerance that you'd expect from a, a contemporary design. So if you, your pilot valve jams or if the, the main uh, hydraulic piston jams, it can still open the, the ports and continue to, to function. So nothing, nothing especially new or different about them, but we've got all within one module, the servo itself, the pilot valve, and then the electric um, actuator that provides the stability augmentation functions up there as well. Okay. And Jonas is asking, will the starter generator help with the uh, help taking down the aircraft, the helicopter, in the event of an engine failure? No, it has no effect on that. It's connected to the, uh, the gas generator shaft, so it isn't directly connected to the power turbine at all. Um, so it, it won't help with that. Some of the, the augmented systems that you've seen uh, are either electric motors mounted on the gearbox or they'd have to be mounted on the, 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 uh, the back half of the, the engine and the power turbine. Um, there's all sorts of patents and IP that cover that sort of stuff, so we can't go anywhere near it. That's great. And just that as an information, uh, we have still some questions. Great to uh, put them on because we're going to try to answer as many as we can. Today, we're going to close at uh, 15 past the hour. So exactly two hours after the beginning to be disciplined on that. So you can uh, put your uh, questions. We'll continue to do, uh, present them for the next uh, 15 minutes. Next one is about uh, the heli move. So is the heli move system powerful enough to mount the HS50 on a trailer for short distances? Uh, the, that's a good question. It depends on the ramp of the trailer. We'd have to give you a, it's it, the limiting load case that we've used is a 10 degree slope uh, uphill on uh, soft ground. So that gives us a torque at the wheel, if I remember rightly, of about 340 Newton meters. Um, and so that, that, that's the design limit of it. There'll be a little bit of margin above that, but we'd have to go and back calculate exactly what the ramp for the, the trailer requires. 
Okay. And Sean is asked, but also, um, would they want to be transporting the aircraft short distances with everything intact, blades on and everything, or it would be better to take the blades off, right? No, no, no. Again, uh, they'd end up having, there'd be, a whole, there's a whole, there'd be a whole set of shipping instructions to be able to manage the aircraft for, for road transport. Uh, helicopters really don't like being shipped by, uh, by road. You have to be very careful. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Sean is asking, I'm curious to know how the reception of this amazing product and engineering in-house is being received by the big names, uh, mentioning Boeing, Bell, Leonardo, etc. Uh, any uh, resistance or willingness to integrate their systems or nothing yet? Uh, I don't know. The, is that the, the supply chain or other manufacturers? Um, it's hard to say by the question. I think it's um, saying other um, manufacturers. So I, I think I think you've you've got a. I, th I think um, the the general view is everybody tends to think they're doing it the right way, right? So I, I think the other other manufacturers remain uh, a little bit skeptical at the scale of the the undertaking. Of course, um, the main light helicopter manufacturer has been substantially vertically integrated since the, the word go and have, have done very well out of it. Um, we've taken the approach a little bit further with the, the engine and the, the avionics, but the, the philosophy is, the, is broadly the same and the, the impact uh, and success that they've had demonstrates that the approach is, is sensible. Um, other manufacturers uh, tend to operate with, with products that have a much higher price point so they can carry the cost of, of a bigger supply chain uh, and, and push the development responsibility down to those, those vendors. So that, that works um, well in industries where they're, they're systems integrators and they're developing military products that have a, a, a huge variety of different equipment and systems on them. You, you couldn't do all of that stuff uh all under one roof so i think it's probably a case of, of horses for courses when you're in the ga market and it's incredibly price sensitive uh and it's not possible to hit the price point um without doing it your, yourself it's an academic question really because we have no choice if you want the price point you have to do it this way yeah. great uh, landon is asking about the hill cloud so how will the hill cloud work and is the cockpit going to be independent of the cloud in the event of a server issue that could cause a system outage? Yes. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 air, the aircraft is essentially a sandbox. So the aircraft is completely uh, self-contained. None of the flight critical stuff is important. Think of the, the cloud very much as uh, a, a monitoring and a data sharing function. So at the moment, we're, we're looking at multiple ways of doing that, whether we do it through the app and then up to the cloud uh, with, a, with a time lag there, or whether we do it via some, some form of uh, data connection on board, be that Starlink or uh, or some form of 4 or 5G network. All of those things come with their own problems and there isn't uh, an easy answer. At the moment, uh, the, uh, the the best solution we have is a, a downlink to the, the app and then back up to the cloud when you get back to civilization. But to be quite honest, we haven't done much with that at the moment. We're focusing on the on the aircraft and the, the flight systems. We'll bring all of the back office uh, up to speed while we're going through the approvals process. Okay. And I'm just uh, the next question I think has already been asked. Uh, well, actually, no, but this is a little bit slightly different. So Richard's asking, are you planning a power port that would allow for an external battery charging and power for the climate control while it's parked? Yeah, there is an external power uh, receptacle down by the pilot's seat. So you can you can plug yeah. into ground power there. All right. Um, I think we just uh, missed the question. And I'll just ask it now, which is about where is going to be the location of the first flight test? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Almost certainly uh, Halfpenny Green Airport. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And Charles is asking um, for future pilots and tech training. So just maybe giving, it's a, a pretty broad question, vague question, but maybe um, give a little bit more idea on the training program as far as uh, training pilots that are going to be coming to, so who is going to be training them um, and who's going to be doing the technical training? Uh, 
is this for the factory based stuff so is this for the type rating and factory the safety based. course and then the, yeah so we'll we'll be building a support team a technical support team for flight operations and also for the the technical support of the aircraft at the factory uh, so those people are going to be people with uh, incredible uh, backgrounds in the in the industry in those disciplines lots of experience on other platforms out there and then fully trained and developed by us during the uh, the flight test and the shakedown the longer term shakedown test uh, uh, period so that they've got the the right knowledge and direct connection with the uh, the specialists here at the factory to be able to div deliver top quality training and support particularly for the first few uh, customers uh, examiners uh, instructors and everybody else that goes out there into the field to, to train others okay um any details available on the cargo hook option, Brendan? Uh, we haven't done a great deal with it. So as, uh, as I've said in previous updates, there is a, there's a series of hard points uh, engineered into the, the structure. So we've got nine, uh, sorry, three sets of three uh, generic hard points with uh, uh, quick release fasteners that allow you to mount anything you want to the, uh, the belly of the aircraft that's within a certain envelope, weight, budget and, and CG. Uh, the main cargo hook adapter and the uh, connection feeds for the, the power and the signals is right underneath the main rotor, underneath the aft cabin bulkhead. So you've got a direct load path up to the, the lift frames and the, the gearbox uh, support structure. So all of that is sort of there, <coughs> is sort of there in the um, in the structure. All of the the provisions that we need on our side for it are there. Once we've got that working, then um, we'll be going back a little later in the the program and detailing out the the cargo hook hard cargo hook hardware itself. And again, in fairness, we'll probably just make that uh, do that in a generic way, so people that have got kit out there uh, can use use what they've got and use the aftermarket stuff as well. Okay. And Paul is asking, with PC-1 being located in Stafford, is Halfpenny Green Airfield on the back burner or off the table now as part of your scale-up? So again, Halfpenny Green aircraft was uh, primarily intended to be for flight operations. So this dual approach uh, that we're taking is separating out the flying and the manufacturing just so that we're not uh, held hostage by the need to fly uh, from getting into a production facility that can get us into production. So Hapney Green is our, our favoured approach uh, for flight ops uh, and potentially to, to expand at the airfield subject to, to planning at, at some point in the, in the future. But right now, manufacturing will be done through a series uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, rented modular uh, sites so that there's no barrier to us moving into to production swiftly. So uh, no halfpenny green still still right there for us. Didn't you want to ask right. a great uh, question? Sorry about that. It was the next one. Yes. <laughs> um, okay. And the next one is. I think you have answered this one uh, pretty much. Uh, what is the staff required to build the 500 aircrafts uh, per year? I think I covered that one. We go to the next one, which is from Jack. Um, ever since my helicopter journey has been, I've been using a GoPro to record and document my flights in our building, not only for reference, but also for safety. God forbid, have an accident. Will the XS50 have a camera to record flight in audio? Or a black box? Yes, there's cabin cabin cameras, there's external cameras, all part of the uh, the safety suite that comes with each HX50 uh, helicopter. Uh, there will also be some external hard points where you can mount uh, other equipment subject to the normal regulatory requirements. So we get asked this a lot. Lots of people like using cameras for their, their flights. Um, there is a camera system on board, but I'm sure uh, that will rapidly become out of date with how fast these things develop. So we'll give people the opportunity to use portable devices as well. Okay, very good. Gene's asking, what type of battery will be standard on the HX HC50? Lithium. Okay, lithium battery, great. Okay. Um, Cl Clint, Clint Pulver. Really curious to know, Jace, if you think the risk of ground resonance will be reduced the wheeled version versus the skid version. 
Uh, it should be identical, but for different reasons. So obviously both aircraft uh, need damping. So the skids have to be flexibly mounted so that they're, they're damped uh, and you can uh, tune out the, uh, the ground resonance problem. With the, the wheeled undercarriage, you've obviously got the oleos and the tires that, that provide that, that same function. So there'll be subtle differences, um, but I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to say one is worse than the other at the moment. They're, they're intended to be both identical but for different reasons. Okay. And Thomas is asking, um, the Dexford event showed that the cabin door mechanisms, so the handles, were an issue. Do you have plans to fix those? Because yeah, the, the again, yeah. You've, got to re you've got to remember, we've been focused on all the really difficult stuff. Uh, and when you want to get a, a, your first two, two airframes together, there's all sorts of stuff that's not quite finished that you then have to finish very quickly. Uh, and so the, the, doors, the door uh, latch mechanism, uh, the lock mechanism, uh, and a couple of other features about the door do need a little bit more work. That's being mopped up with this current uh, retool that we're doing at the moment. So they will be significantly improved. Uh, we're not happy with them here uh, and they're, they're receiving a full review. So we will give you some more on that over the coming months in the next few AMAs. Well, they were not the final product anyhow. So it's just something that was not finished, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, now, uh, so the, the, swan, yeah. The, swan, the Swandle action on the outside, I like, uh, and I think most people are happy with that. The flush finish, the look, the feel of it, all that works fine. Mm -hmm. Everything in terms of the locking mechanism and the interior handles wrong, uh, and it needs to be done again. Good, easy fix. Uh, Justin and Becca are asking, will Hill test pilots be doing the first flight tests of all the owners that will be building the HS50s, their HS50s? If so, approximately how many hours will the test pilots be flying before owners start flying their own aircraft? Uh, mm. Yes, test pilots will. And I think once we're fully up and running in production, I'd expect somewhere like three to five. Uh, once the, the, the program's fully up and running, I think the early ones will receive significantly more than that. So, and it, I would also say it does mm. vary territory by territory. So there are some, uh, there are some uh, details with the approvals that might be pushed upon us by the authorities in different parts of the world as well. So we'll have to take that one on a country by country basis. Okay. okay. And Thomas is asking, can the FADEC be uh, manually controlled? And have you thought about the baggage uh, doors opening down like a Citation jet, for example, getting them out of the way? Uh, so no, the so uh, so there isn't a manual reversion on the the engine. We we've gone for two channels of FADEC. That's two totally independent fuel control systems uh, on the the engine that are both electronic. There isn't a manual speed governor, um, but you have got a manual fuel shutoff valve. So if you think of the two extreme runaway cases. Uh, FADEX stops sending fuel to engine, engine stops, you auto-rotate. Uh, if you think of the other problem, engine sends too much fuel to engine and everything overspeeds. In that situation, you can contain it with collective to catch it as it overspeeds, and then you'd have the ability to, to turn the fuel control uh, valve off uh, and then enter auto-rotation or something like that. We've got, we've got to develop these procedures out, but the, there is no uh, manual reversion. It's a very, very, very high reliability uh, FADEX system, uh, ultimately with the ability to independently shut the fuel off as you'd have in he any helicopter. Baggage bay down. Sorry, baggage bay down. I hadn't considered that question. Um, I hadn't thought about it. No, I, it's interesting. I'll have a look. Excellent. Now we just uh, are in the two hour mark. So that's going to be our last question now. We'll be closing the session. It was a great one as always. Jason gave so many updates and we had a very good session of Q&A. Almost, almost all of them, but all they are coming up, coming up a new one. So just have to um, take them through other channels or we'll uh, be happy to pick them up on the next AMA as well. So Timothy is asking a very simple question about the syndicate ownership. Uh, Jason, this will be our last question, and then you can close it. And uh, great to have everybody today, uh, literally from all over the world. In the case of uh, syndicated ownership, would all the owners have to attend the two-week build for the HS50? Could non-pilots be part of the owners, or would an all, uh, all owners have to be licensed pilots? 
Uh, no, you don't have to be a licensed pilot to, to own a, an aircraft of any type. Uh, a company can own an aircraft, an individual can own an aircraft, a syndicate can own an aircraft, anybody can, anybody with the right legal standing can, can own an aircraft. So that, that's not a problem. Um, I think to own a share of a, uh, of a experimental or a permit to fly aircraft in the, the UK, for example, there are some uh, lower limits to the amount of it, you know, I, can, I think it's 5%, to benefit from some of the other privileges uh, of, of owning a, uh, an aircraft. I think there's a lower limit of 5%, but beyond that, it's pretty flexible. Um, in terms of how do we deal with syndicated ownership in terms of the, the, the build school, uh, that's an open question with the authorities at the moment. They are, uh, in the, the last conversations we had about it, they were very open-minded and very flexible about it, um, because clearly, if it's multiple, uh, owners, they can't all do all of it, and so some rational basis for that's got to be agreed. Uh, I don't expect that's going to be a problem. I expect you'll be able to designate a builder or a number of builders at your uh, at your discretion, uh, but then some of the maintenance privileges only get carried over to those people uh, in accordance with what they've what they've done. But for, for our aircraft, that's not even a, an issue because most of them will be maintained as per a certified aircraft. Phenomenal. We yeah, had an incredible session and actually we look at the numbers because the numbers are always good to, to means to uh, get the feedback and the interest of these sessions. And today we have two, we had 2,487 people connecting to this AMA. So a great, great success, obviously a lot of interest. And it was a pleasure to share all the, uh, actually Jason to share the update and to receive all your questions. Thank you again for attending. We will continue to have uh, daily presentations, Michi and I. Tomorrow there will be another one. If you're interested to know more about the opportunity to pre-order the aircraft, that's the right place to go. And you can check that out and you know, enroll for the session either tomorrow or any other day. Thank you very much, everyone. Have an excellent morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are. Great to have you all. Bye-bye. Yes. Thanks, guys. Thank, Thank you, you for your time Thank and your you. questions. Bye-bye.